I will be presenting the Pulsar IA connector that I developed for the last months. And well, with no further, I think I will continue for the today's session. As you can see, this is the agenda for today. I will show you a little bit, give you a little bit about, uh, some context about what is Pulsar. Um, the initial approach that I take on the development, which is the current implementation right now, and, and some example of how to use it right now, and also which, what is the next steps on this uh, connector. First of all, um, I want to introduce myself. I am a software engineer at Watchline, and you may think, what is Watchline? So basically, Watchline is a, a global technology service provider, and uh, basically, Watchline builds high quality digital products and platforms to accelerate to the current market. Um, Watchline has several uh, values, and you just want to focus on the last one, which is doing well while doing good. So this is through uh, not just development to the market, as well as to encourage to the community as well to increase the knowledge on the technology. And this is through the academy program that commits to develop uh, the talent and learning new tendencies in the uh, community. Uh, basically, Wiseland is a, a worldwide company. Uh, he has several, uh, it's, Wiseland has several offices uh, in, around the world. There are like uh, several offices in Mexico, Guadalajara, uh, Vietnam, uh, Spain, Colombia, and also many employees are working in a hybrid mode around the world, which allows us to uh, have a diversity of employees from different nationalities and increasing the employees to more than 2,000 employees right now. So uh, you may think, uh, okay, this is Washland, so why am I here? Uh, I belong to a, a team in Washland that is currently working as being contributors. And we are we working in different areas in the project right now of the open source. In, which in my case, I will work on the Pulsar IO connector, which I want you to present right now. Okay, what is Pulsar? Basically, I want you to focus on the basics. The basics are a pub sub uh, system, which is the short for a publish subscribe message platform, in which uh, the consumers of message subscribe to a specific topic or a channel, uh, in which they are interested in in and each time a message is associated with a topic, uh, that topic is published uh, and all the subscribers will immediately receive all the message. Okay, having this in mind, what is Pulsar? Well, first of all, Pulsar was created uh, originally as a distributed message system and a streaming platform. And it was created at Yahoo at the beginning. And right now, uh, well, Pulsar is a multi-tenant, high-performance solution for server-to-server -server messaging system. Basically, it combines the best features of a traditional messaging system like uh, RabbitMQ uh, with a pub sub system such as Kafka. So basically, you get the best of two worlds in high-performance and cloud-native package. So why Pulsar, you may think? Uh, basically, because that was the task at the beginning. <laughs> they delivered me this, this task. And also, Pulsar has many features to work on this area. I just want to focus on two of them, which, which is the last ones, the Euro application and the tire storage. Uh, the Euro application allows us to uh, have multiple clusters around the way, uh, world in case of some disaster recovery. I'm not sure about how this functionality works because I haven't uh, worked deeply in this uh, functionality, but I know that it's one an area that it um, different uh, from any other system. Also, they have a tire storage in which they have a, in, you can storage your data for an indefinite periods of times. So what is the Pulsar architecture? Well, at the highest level, a Pulsar instance could be composed of one or more Pulsar clusters. This is a Pulsar cluster, and in which in this cluster we have, it's composed of two layers. The first one is a stateless service layer that is a comprise of a set of brokers, as you can see, that receive and deliver the messages. And also we have another layer that, that is the 
and stateful persistent uh, layer, which basically is the storage la layer. And it comprise, it's a comprise of a set of Apache Bookkeeper in this case. And these nodes are called uh, bookies in which you can uh, store your data uh, as I mentioned before. So now we have this in mind. What is the core of Pulsar? Basically the core of Pulsar is the message. So the messages are the basic unique of Pulsar and each message has several properties that we can, uh, that well Pulsar implemented. But I, I just want to focus on these three uh, properties that we will have in, we will discuss uh, in this uh, session. The first one, the sequence ID. Each Pulsar uh, of, each message in Pulsar, sorry, belongs to an order sequence on its topic and is not a default option. You have, it has to be uh, assigned by the producer. So it has to be uh, configured uh, by the user. Which constraints do we have? Well, the sequence ID should be greater or equal than zero. The next sequence ID should be greater than the before one. And it's not necessary for sequence ID to be uh, consecutive. What does it mean? That uh, there can be holes between the message. Uh, let's say that we are in the message, I don't know, 65. And the next message from that message could be, I don't know, 87. So this uh, big hole between this sequence. Next one, the message ID. And this basically, as the name said, is the, a unique, um, the ID of an, a specific message, which indicates the position in a ledger. You may think, what is a ledger? Well, to explain a ledger uh, is kind of, uh, I don't want to focus uh, deeper in this um, topic, but let's just say that is like, the ID that indicates where is the message within the Apache Bookkeeper or our storage. So uh, one of the constraints that we have on message ID is that it's not a numeric value as in Kafka that we have the offsets and it has its own value that uh, uh, type in Java, which is a message ID class. And the last one, the publish time, which basically is the timestamp of when the message is published. And by default, it's assigned by the producer. So the user doesn't have to configure anything in the uh, configuration. Next, I want to focus and discuss the clients that are available in Pulsar. We have two interfaces. The first one is the consumer interface, which uh, basically handles automatically the man, uh, cursors with, uh, between inside uh, the message, inside the topic, sorry. So you don't have to worry about uh, where is the current position. Automa um, Pulsar does it by default. And this is something that we have to keep in mind. The next one is the reader interface, which uh, is somehow allows uh, in the SDA, well, for the implementation in Beam to handle the cursors with, uh, inside the uh, well, in this in this case, the queue or, or buffer, uh, as you want to see in the example. So, having all in mind a uh, little bit of context of Pulsar, what is the current? Uh, what was the initial approach on this implementation? Well, you may you may know what is this. This is a a basic SDF implementation or flow, as you can uh, saw in the Apache Beam documentation. So basically, uh, the SDF enables the user to create modu modular components that contains uh, different IOs. And uh, this is achieved by pairing each element with a restriction, as we can see in the first uh, step of, of this flow. So basically, the restriction is the what part of this element uh, will be performed. And we can define a restriction as a, a subset of work that will have be necessary to uh, to process when the process element arrives. So basically there are some steps in, in this flow, as you can see, which in the first one, each element is paired with a restriction. Then each element is, and restriction pair is split. And then 
the runner will redistribute the element and restriction pairs to several workers. And, and after this, the element and restriction pairs are being processed in parallel. But between this process, uh, there could be a, between this, this last step, the element and the restriction pair can be passed and it is on processing and to be split into four elements and restrictions, as you can see in, in, in the middle, the checkpointing and the splits. Okay, we already uh, reviewed the SDF, but what about the current uh, implementation? Which restriction can we use for Pulsar? Well, as you remember, as you can see here, basically in this uh, image, we have a, a, um, a topic that is being read in Kafka for SDF. So in this example, we are reading from Kafka and starting from the offset uh, 100 to the infinite. And this is the over restriction, 100 to the infinite. How, however, while such a call runs, um, sorry, uh, I mean, when the process element comes and call the processing the entire restriction, it will, of course, never be complete because it is, um, it is processing to the infinite. So we don't have for sure how, how, when it's going to end this process. So in this case, it will, uh, the runner can split the restriction into finite primary uh, uh, parts and instead it, it could be going after it. Uh, somehow we define when to end this process. So in, in Kafka, they use this uh, offset, but what can we use in Pulsar? Uh, basically for Pulsar, we can assume the same as the Kafka implementation. Uh, if we are reading from a Pulsar topic, starting from the offset 100, that can be represented by the restriction uh, 100 to, well, in this case, we are reading from zero to infinite, and then we are split into several uh, parts until we reach the infinite, or in this case, we're representing that is in the streaming case. But what could be the issue here? Uh, could Pulsar can behave similar as Kafka? Well, basically the answer is no. Why? Because of these three properties. Uh, Let's review again. Uh, we have the sequence ID, and for the, this one, we will be an, unable to use unless we have some control over the producer, which could not be the case because it is not a guarantee. Uh, this property is not guaranteed, and we don't have a way to control directly to when the producer is launched if we just want to read inside Beam. So, and as well, uh, we have to. Uh, we don't have like any control on, on this area. So, well, the obvious reason would be to use SSID. But here's an issue, and I want to uh, go further in this detail because which constraint could we have in this uh, property? Well, as you remember in Kafka, uh, each partition is in order, and each message which in a partition has an incremental ID which is uh, called an offset. So each message, when each message is assigned, uh, once the, uh, the, the offset is uh, successfully produced to a topic partition. So we already have uh, and know that it is an incremental way and is guaranteed by the producer. But in Pulsar, uh, each message is assigned with that message ID. And we already know that mes a message ID is not a numeric value. It, it is a, it has his own data type. So how can we handle this value in a way that our SDF can control this uh, example? Uh, well, I just want to focus that uh, before I go to the next slide, that a message ID has its own value and is formed by these three properties that builds a message ID. With this in mind, there are some codes that allow us to convert a message ID, which is uh, which has his own data type, into a numeric value, as in this example. As you can see, we got the message ID as the input, and we return the numeric value, and could be the same to return a message ID, receiving the up uh, the numeric value. But what is the issue here? 
Just focus on, on how it's being converted. Let's see the next slide. Let's assume that we are converting uh, our current message ID into a numeric value, as you can see here in the, uh, at almost at the end with the uh, number 740. And the next message ID, if we convert it to a numeric value, we got the uh, 560, uh, sorry, 76. So we already see that we, convert, we can convert to a numeric value, but there could be, there could be some ed edge cases in which they will not allow us to convert these uh, uh, values because it is due uh, the rollover of the bits because uh, we're convert using and converting this using a uh, 32 bits. And if we get the delta from these two uh, numeric values, we see that we are getting a much greater numeric value than the, three, than the value that has 32 bits. So we will have to handle these kind of issues if, if we try to convert to a numeric value a message ID. So it, it would be more work that to do, more validations to add, and maybe it will not be like the best approach to use. So what can we do? Well, basically, the obvious uh, choice will be using the publish time. Why? Because it's already assigned by the producer, so we don't have to do anything. And it already indicates when the message is published. And also, our uh, Pulsar API allows us to search for a specific message uh, within the queue, setting, uh, passing just the timestamp of the message. So now that we define that we can use publish time, we got another question. Which client interface can we use? As I told you at the beginning, we have two client interfaces, the consumer interface and the reader interface. But for the reader interface, is the one that we need to, to choose because it basically allows us to handle the courses by, by us. So we, we, we need to do this in order to configure the and work with the uh, SDF bit, uh, inside BIM. So that, uh, that has allowed us to go to the next uh, step, which is the current implementation. So as you can see here, this is basically how it should be, uh, how it looks right now when we apply a restriction to in Pulsar, uh, when reading from Pulsar. Basically, we are, if we are reading from the beginning, we are reading from zero to the infinite, and then we will be splitting into um, finite and several pieces, this, this work, onto a specific timestamp, right? But we can go in detail uh, in next slides. So I just want to, I just want to focus today uh, in the, how the reader was implemented. Basically, we got uh, our initial restriction for the Pulsar IO connector, which in this case we were setting that we are reading from zero to the infinite. And if the user wants to pass the an initial time or end time to delimit this process, the user can do that, do it. And then we got the process element. What is happening here in the process element? As you can see, we have two uh, things to worry about. Uh, the first one is the, that we are using the reader interfaces, as you can see. And the next one is that we are using the current timestamp of the message that is published for our uh, offset between uh, the SDF. Okay, so now we already defined the initial restriction and the process element. Now we have to worry about how the split restriction should be working. So how will be this happening? Okay, for this one, we got this approach, which is uh, based on the Kafka implementation, which is basically, um, is creating a, a new tracker. Uh, each time it reads from the latest message that was read and until the latest message that is available in the queue. And it's generating each, each um, range between these two, um, the limiters that we have, right? So basically we can see it 
as this example. So let's assume that we are reading from zero to that specific timestamp, which is which ends in 25. And then what the split is going to do is we are going to read to the message which is has the uh, call D to that that is a specific timestamp. And then we're going to read until the latest available measure that is in the queue, which is F, with that specific timestamp. So basically, that's how uh, the split is being processed in, inside the SDF. OK, we already know how to split the restriction inside the SDF. Now we need to worry about the watermark because we're working with a streaming uh, in this case. So. As you know, in any data processing system, there is a certain amount of lag between the time of a data event occurs and the time that that actual element of the data it gets processed. So there is no guarantee that the data events will appear in the pipeline, so in the same order that they were generated. So in this case, Beam tracks a watermark, which uh, allows us to handle this late data. And basically, as you know, we have two types of watermarks. The, the first one is the time stamp observing, and the other one is the external clock observing. The first one uses the output of the time stamp of each record to compute the watermark. And the, and the second one, it will be used external clock, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, a clock which can be used for the current server that in which is being processed, or um, as the name says, it's an external clock. It's not the same clock as we have of the process. Okay, so for this case, and since we are using a timestamp as restriction, the timestamp of each record of a mess or message is always equivalent to the current offset, right? So for our implementation, we got several uh, watermark implementation that we can use inside the uh, BIM, the current BIM implementations. So we got several implementation, but in this case, we focus on the mon monotonically increasing because it observes the timestamp of the records that is being uh, output inside a 2FN and reports the timestamp of the last element seen in the current watermark. So it makes sense since the records that we that are being reading is the order in, in which they have been appended. So it's the current ops in this case that are being used. So basically, uh, it, it makes possible to track a, a near perfect watermark, but it is not always like the ca this case. So for our reader, we have two types of timers. We have the publish time, which is the current offset that is being used, and the processing time, which basically is the time when, when the message is being processed. So by default, we use the processing time of the event to the current offset. And now if the time span of if the time stamp, sorry, of this offset is being used when it depends on the ordering of the user, we will want to provide some um, kind of user interface in order to allow the user to change between uh, using this current timestamp and the processing timestamp, right? So we got this uh, two function in which uh, um, allows the, the user, the final user to use between processing time and publish time. So now we got um, some examples about how can we use uh, the current implementation that is being uh, in BIM right now. For our Pulsar IO reader, we got uh, these functions, but if we just want to read from the beginning, we just can use those ones that are marked, which we, we, we just need the client URL of. If we, we want, we can pass the Pulsar client. Uh, we need as well the admin URL in order to get the latest available message in the queue. We need, the, obviously, we need the topic of this uh, that we need to read, uh, be, that we will be reading inside the uh, Pulsar. And the other ones are the um, optional stuff that we uh, that we can use. So uh, we can pass the start timestamp, the end timestamp, 
in order to delimit a limit and to not make this as a streaming, uh, we can use it as batch process. And as well, we can pass the publish time. We can define if we can use, if we need to use publish time or we need, if you, we need to use processing time. By default, we are using publish time, so it's not necessary to you to set a publish time. Uh, once we define this, you just apply this to the pipeline. So you may think, okay, this is a reader. What about the writer? So basically the writer is, um, in terms of implementation is uh, simpler than the reader because in the reader we have to worry about a lot of things. Of course in the writer we have to worry uh, of uh, another things, but it's, it's just can handle as a dual function in this case. But uh, for basic explanation, uh, we just need to pass the pulsar client URL that we need to read, the topic that we are writing to, and just pass the message that we need to send to that a specific message. And basically, this is how you can apply it to the, our current pipeline. Just passing the message and setting the writer. Okay, so as you can see, it is pretty a basic implementation of Pulsar. It is not the monster that currently is in, uh, we have in being like such as Kafka, but there's a lot of work to do in this area because it is not finished. This connector is not finished. Uh, we need to implement several things. Uh, for example, Pulsar allows us to analyze message in order to delete it from the, our persistent storage. So this is not currently implemented in the connector. And as you know, in Kafka, we have, by default, it handles the partitions, but in Pulsar, you need to configure uh, by, by your hand how many partitions do you need? And it's not, it is an optional thing to do. It's not necessary to uh, set a partition inside Kafka, inside Pulsar, sorry. Uh, we can also uh, work on a dynamic stop limit. I mean, in which we run the process and uh, when we already run the process and we decide to stop that process, well, we need to also work in this area because I saw that there's some implementation in Kafka that's still working on. And also there are another topic like, like Pulsar has several subscription types in which um, decides how to deliver the data between the, the consumer and producer. But uh, this is another topic that we need to handle. And there is a lot of work to do. Uh, there is the, only a few topics that can come into my mind like to work on, and I saw that there's another contributors in Beam that are working on and adding more value to this uh, connector. And basically, that's uh, pretty much all for me. I don't know if you have any questions about it. <laughs>